All right, everybody, back at it again. Ding, ding, ding. This is Ringside Prevents, per, excuse me, Presents. We are back at it again, Corner Confessions, and I am here with the epic, illustrious, beautiful, legendary Jessica Halter. She is in the building, and this is, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan out real quick. This is very much an esteemed honor. Um, I've known about her for a very long time. I've known about Punani Poets, for a very long time so they have the opportunity to sit here and interview her for my channel this has been long awaited very much anticipated and definitely honored jessica thank you so much for this interview thank you for gracing us with your presence thank you <laughs> so i know you okay you know we're gonna we're gonna climb the delorean go back in time for a little bit i know you from uh late night at my house Parents in bed, oh my God. sneaking downstairs, turn on the HBO. You got to make sure the HBO is, can't oh have the volume on when you have, you know. And that was back in the day, you know, the TV with the big butt, you know, big backs and whatnot. But, um, you know, HBO for everybody out there, you know, for the Gen Xers and the Millennials and even the Gen Zs, HBO is, it stands for Home Box Office. I mean, if you have HBO Max now, but back then we're talking about Taxi Cab Confessions. We're talking about hookers on the point. We're talking about uh, G-string <laughs> divas and of course, real sex series. Who can forget? A lot of us learn what sex was because of real sex. You know, I grew up in a household where we didn't talk about sex. My parents didn't really have the birds and the bees conversation with me. So everything, for the most part, I learned about sex. I, you know, I hate to say it, but I learned from watching television, from watching Cinemax. Even back then, as a little kid, I'm like, I don't know what that is, but it looks good, and one day I'm going to have it. But <laughs> I remember seeing real sex, and I remember seeing an, an, a sketch about Punani poets, and I remember you, I remember that beautiful big hair, just, you know, the bodacious presence, and you were, I mean, you gave a great presentation uh, to the HBO audience and to pretty much, you know, the entire world watching. So I'm familiar with Punani poets, but for the people out there watching right now on the channel, kind of give a brief description of what Punani Poets is and what was the inspiration, you know, behind starting it. Um, the Punani Poets is a theater company. Um, it's a project, actually, part of my nonprofit organization, which is Hip Inc. Um, we just create conversations around sex mm -hmm. and uh, black sexuality in particular. So I started the Punani Poets in 1995 as an answer to um, the alarming amount of black women who were contracting HIV, mm. right? And so I guess I conceived the project uh, shortly before Easy e announced that he had HIV, but really went into full swing with it after mm. he announced that he had HIV because I realized, you know, sex should not kill us like it should not kill us but since the disease is out here and we don't know i'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist too <laughs> so i thought they were out to get us i was like oh my god they're using our music to do it they're using sex to kill us they're you know and control us and get our bodies you know under control under their control and everything so i just thought it was a very important conversation for us to have and the weird thing about sex and black people is that we like to do it but we don't really like to talk about it mm. even with the partner we're actually having sex with we don't want to talk about it you know so mm. okay yeah. and so um no i definitely understand i mean when when easy e when it was announced that he had a said you know shot um the world especially the hip-hop community and um you know it was most certainly an epic tragedy. It did, however, spark a lot of conversations behind, you know, HIV and AIDS prevention. So, um, very much needed. So, with Punani Poets, I mean, the, well, first off, how did, how did the meeting with HBO, how did that come about? <laughs> um, okay, so I had this idea, right? I was like, I'm going to do this book. It wasn't this book. It was a different book. But I was like, I'm going to do this book and I'm going to put it erotic poetry in it. I'm going to have some of my friends who are entertainers contribute. So the book is really an anthology of different pe different people's perspective on sex and mm -hmm. different parts of sex. 
I would just tell them, like, if there was a topic I wanted to discuss, I would ask them to write something original for that. So, say, Brandon Purnell wrote a piece called, um, What Part of It Didn't You Understand? Because I was reading one of my favorite authors, um, Walter Mosley, writes this uh, character, um, Easy Rollins. And there's a story early, early in his series about um, when Easy Rollins has sex with his wife. He's, he's like drunk the night before. And he's talking about how great it was. And then in the morning, his wife has left him. Mm. He doesn't understand why. But looking back at his story, you realize she wasn't participating in it. He was having sex with her, but she wasn't participating in it. So in his drunken super, he rapes his wife who he loved mm. and um, it was such a real conversation that never made its way into the classroom or anything like that sometimes we don't because of our lack of communication around sex mm -hmm. we don't realize even when we're infringing on somebody else's boundaries you know when it comes to sex and so I had asked Brandon to write a poem about that you know, where you're having sex with this woman, you think it's the bomb, but by the end, the audience needs to realize you've just raped this woman. Mm -hmm. So in the end of the poem, he goes to jail, which doesn't happen to the character in the book, but yeah. So I wanted to bring conversations like that to life on stage with theatrics. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you have a poetry book, like, people don't read. Not like that. So I put the pictures in the book, and then I turned the book into um, a soundtrack, actually, with Dwayne Wiggins turned it into a soundtrack and we started um, doing these theatrical performances. And I, one of, the, one of the girls in the show, Tracy Bartlow, her sister was in New York and was working with Bring In The Noise, Bring In The Funk. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm gonna have this book, I'm gonna have a soundtrack, I'm gonna have a show, and we about to go on the road and do a college tour, like Bring In The Noise, Bring In The Funk. This is what I'm thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really trying to go the real sex route because of, because of the platform, because it was so, you know, sexual and had its stigma. And I really wanted to go a different direction, but I soon found that people are very uh, black and white about sexuality. Either mm -hmm. you have sex or you don't. Like, it, they, they just think it's so weird. So a lot of the colleges were like, no, even the college I went to, Howard was like, no. Like they let the vagina monologues play there, but they wouldn't let the pronounced poets play there. So mm, it's, it's interesting talking about sex, but more than that, it's interesting what people's reaction is when black women talk about sex. Mm. It becomes something different. It becomes, oh no, how dare you pull yourself out of that stereotype. We, we were so comfortable with you sitting right there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the Punani Poets came about as uh, intellectual response to sexuality, black female sexuality in hip hop, mm -hmm. which at the time was only represented by video vixens. Right, right. With no voices. And so all you could see is ass and titties, ass and titties. Yeah, but there are some very, very interesting stories that these girls have to tell so yeah punana poets we're poets but we also perform with exotic dancers mm -hmm. giving them a voice which we call body poetry you know body they, poetry body poetry yeah nice. they bring their body poetry to our words and it really tells a very poignant story and at the same time i'm not stupid i realize you know men are not going to want to take their wives on a date night typically just to see poetry so I added all the different elements to it and made it a lot like how hip-hop was at the time just giving the women a voice mm -hmm. you know which you know I still do my work but it's just amazing to see um, some of the artists in hip-hop now who do speak their truth and we're going to go into that because I actually you know I do want to pick your brain about that get your thoughts but you mentioned before we before we go down that road. You mentioned you know something that a lot of people know about. People are very familiar with vagina monologues. Mm -hmm. um, you know what would you say are the main differences between Punani poets 
and vagina monologues because even before you said that, you know, it sparked in my mind like, is this similar to vagina monologues? Because that's, you know, that's that's reached mainstream. People know about that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what are some, you know, can you compare and contrast the two? Um, they're nothing the same. Mm -hmm. They're they're completely different. I do want to say she might have done vagina monologues for the first time the same year. I can see the Konami poets, I believe, around 1995. Mm -hmm. um, there, was, um, there was the conversation being had in places about female sexuality, but not like with the Punani poets. With the Punani poets, we gave voice to black women, urban black women, mm. uh, hip-hop generation of, of the time, black women, who really were just not encouraged to talk about real issues. You know, um, when Tupac did, was it Brenda's Got a Baby? Mm -hmm. That was amazing. That was groundbreaking. That was groundbreaking, yeah. So it was very few and far between. You had real conversations about things that really happened involving and including the vagina. You know, even when I went to get the book financed, you know, um, I went to a nonprofit organization in San Francisco, but they were like, oh no. We need to, if it's going to be, if it's going to address HIV, then we need to include gay men. Mm -hmm. I'm like, everything is not about gay men. This is actually called Punani. Yes. Because it's about pussy. And this doesn't include men. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't. About, it's not about the men. And I just think it's amazing, it's just, since we're on the subject, that everything ends up being about men. Mm -hmm. No matter what. Even... God, we call him a he. We call God a he, you know. Um, I don't know. It's like we silence ourselves. We we don't want to hear from the pussy. We only you know want the pussy and the daughter. Mm. Now you know, in terms of black women and sexuality and expressing, you know, the the you know just the power of the sexuality. Do you think you know? You mentioned hip hop. Do you think, you know, you have artists like Cardi B, Meg Thee Stallion, you know, City Girls, you know, um, Sweetie, so on and so forth. You think they are the, would they be considered the beneficiaries of the work that you did back in 1995, you know, as far as giving a voice? You think, you know, as far as what they're able to do, you know, in terms of the inroads they're making in hip hop and not only the inroads but the success you think that you know the work that you i mean you seems like you know what you guys did was kick open that door oh, and yeah. you guys just like look it's time mm -hmm. to give the voiceless a voice mm -hmm. and express and let people know like look you know black sexuality is not um just a figment of any you know people's imagination like it's real um it's something that a lot of people can you know some it's, it's a lot of people may be misunderstood about it and you know, our understanding may be coming from what well, that time, you know, I'm a teenager, preteen, you know, our understanding of black sexuality, even as it pertains to women, we were getting it from men. We were getting it from, you know, rap artists and whatnot. And many times it was um, through degradation. Mm -hmm. So do you think Punani Poets, even today, the impact it has, you know, you see that elevated and, and amplified with the women who are speaking out now? I do. I was, um, I've been working on a new book. Mm -hmm. um, that I've been working on a couple books. But I had to separate kind of my, my blogging, you know, when, when COVID, can I say COVID? You, when you when the C word hit, um, I, I wasn't touring and I was alone with my mind like the rest of the world in this Nani's Playhouse, you know, with everything just reeling in my head. And I was trying to find some warm reprieve for my own mind one day. And I was watching Meg Thee Stallion, who I don't think I've ever seen perform. Um, yeah, I think that was my first time actually seeing her, a, a video of her. And she was on Saturday Night Live. Oh, that was an epic performance. It was fucking phenomenal. And she did I a great cried job. Because I was like, oh my God. This is what I've been wanting. This is what I've been wanting for women to understand. You can be all those things. You can be the cook, 
the housewife, the hoe, the minister, the mom. You can be all those things. And you can also be an activist. And you can also be an activist. And hope pussy needs to be protected just like housewife pussy. Mm -hmm. You understand? Uh, Speak on it. It was amazing. It was amazing. No, I remember that. I remember that. I don't even remember who the host was, but I definitely remember Meg Thee Stallion's um, performance. And <gasps> it blew me away because I didn't expect it because, you know, I'm thinking... She brought it. Yeah, she, she brought it. it. I mean, she did She did a great job she with, with the twerking and, every, and the sexuality, but the she she got political she got and but she I, gave a voice to the victims out there and she did and, and what, was what i really loved was that she didn't hold back on the brazen sexuality mm -hmm. the, you can walk the line i mean beyonce walks the line she walks the line she mm -hmm. you know she took she took toes in it every once in a while every comes, once in a while comes right back and comes right back to like this quiet position where i mean she does represent someone too. She represents the wife mm -hmm. and the mom. She represents most of us, you know. But Meg, Meg is the revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Meg is the one really coming out um, with her fist up and just pushing it in your face without, without trying to titillate you. I don't believe she's trying to titillate you. I don't get that from her. She's not um, Lil' Kim. Mm -hmm. Little Kim was titillation. Who not be poets is great because we have a cast of people, so I cast people to play those different parts. Mm -hmm. You know, so I have a hoe, I have a housewife. Uh, we always have a lesbian of some sort, like in the show. Um, we did it. a girl who was bisexual, so she played. Um, she's kind of androgynous, so she played like a, a very you know, frilly kind of girly girl seducing a man in the same show where she played a stud. Mm. So we try to show um, all the duality. Like, there's so much going on with women. We're amazing. We're fucking amazing. You are. We're so amazing. Men want to be us now. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's something going on, but I, I agree. Um, I would say, I would take it, uh, take it up a notch. You guys are phenomenal. Thank you. And the world wouldn't be a world I want to live in without women. Oh, can you imagine I try. I don't want to. Uh, I but you know, even in twenty twenty one, well, you just you know we're we're here. You know we're we're uh, broadcasting from the great state of Georgia. Um, even in twenty twenty one, in states like Georgia, where things can still be considered or seen as conservative, how you know if Punani Poets didn't come out in ninety five, if it came out today, do you think it would be received the exact same way? No. Oh, it definitely wouldn't be received the same way because it was not received well. Mm -hmm. We we got, um, for one, I didn't do the initial outbreak. Well, I mean, and people in Oakland knew who we were for years. And I had been a hip-hop entertainment journalist, so I knew people already. I had some press for it, so it had a little bit of uh, popularity in the beginning before we got on HBO. But if you were outside of my immediate like hip-hop family, whatever um you probably didn't know about it so you thought oh and they're gonna just get a bunch of black women to talk all sexy and strip on a white man's channel like mm -hmm. people were not feeling that so uh one of our first uh shows we did get to do a college campus it was um university of colorado mm -hmm. it was like the first big show we did oh there were thousands of kids there but not the black kids they protested mm -hmm. The Black Student Union had a, a picket line in front of the theater, just like we were just these horrible people. So it was not easy. Mm -hmm. And I really had to stick to my guns. Plus, I was married at the time to a man and a cop. Like, mm -hmm. it was a lot. And um, people were really not ready. I think now, I wouldn't say that there would be a need for it in the same way that there was then. For one, I think women are in a different place. Women are a lot more um, independent, mm -hmm. for real independent. Back then we would say it, <laughs> but it wasn't the same, especially in a place like this great state of Georgia where women are so educated and just so bad about it. I've never seen anything like it. And mm -hmm. I lived in DC, but I've never seen women 
as fierce as, as the women that I've met down here. Oh, Ooh. it's it's a, lot of, it's a lot of black girl magic going on down here. Oh my God, it Big is time. amazing. So with all of that and, and me being in this new place too, um, I probably wouldn't be doing it. I would probably be doing something else. I'm actually kind of shifting my energy in that direction anyway, just because there's so much out there and I've already come, um, done so much, created so much content mm -hmm. that I'm putting the content together, I'm putting it out. I have a really great agent now, so God willing, she can find a really good book deal for these three books that you know I've already written, already you know done with that. So I've really been a lot focused on a program that's been really close to my heart for many years. I want to hear about it. So, you know, talking again about the great state of Georgia, and again, you know, at, Georgia is not Atlanta. Atlanta is a, is a city in Georgia, but the rest of Atlanta may not necessarily be conservative, but Georgia is. Um, and you still have, even in the black churches, even in the black bourgeoisie, you have that conservative undertone that, you know, isn't going anywhere. Nope. What do you, what would you say to the critics, to the people who, you know, would criticize your work or feel like they may misunderstand your work and think, oh, this is just another way to over-sexualize or hyper-sexualize black women, objectify black women, or reduce black women to just vagina as if, you know, these are, these are comments and platitudes that are, are ringing from left to right from the, in the conservative community. But, you know, the feeling of black women are already hyper-sexualized and it's affecting um, our communities. What would you say to the people who may not fully understand your mission and what Punani poets or just what you know your goal is? You know, what would you say to those critics? Um, I would send them to my channel. Mm -hmm. You know, so they could really understand what the work is. Because if you do, as the students did at, at the uh, college in Colorado, if you assume that the entire project is about an 11 minute segment on HBO Real Sex, well, then you couldn't possibly know what the project is about. Um, the sexuality is a way to make you look and to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Someone told me once, when a man speaks, people listen. When a woman speaks, they look first. And if they like what they see, and they'll listen. Mm. I got you. So, you know, you talked about books, and I see you're holding a book. I am holding a book. So, can you briefly give us the title and what it's about? Well, this is Verbal Penetration. It's not about any one thing, just like the project. Mm -hmm. It's about many things. It's an anthology, um, and it includes lots of different voices of people just talking about different things, mostly having to do with love, sex, relationship. There's also some spirit talk in here too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I had an interesting talk with my neighbor today. Break it down. Yeah, I just, just thought about this. We had an interesting talk and I was saying um, how in my experience working with the Punani Project and talking directly with the supporters and fans and some of our, our nonprofit sponsors and stuff who are mostly women. I have some men too who mm -hmm. support the project, um, write checks like and say, hey, we love the work you're doing. So um, having that, I know that people are interested in this project because they actually support it. It is 100% fan supported and has been that way for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. So we've never gotten a grant. Never, ever. We've always worked for everything. And um, it's been completely supported by the fans. But I was talking about um, some of these women who are so uh, successful and powerful and really good positions in life. And how a lot of times people say, oh, the black woman um, can't get a man. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Um, this is what my neighbor and I were talking about. And I said, but it's not true, because anybody can get a man. Have you met them? Anybody can get a man. It's not hard to get a man. Now, if you can get the man you want, like the one who's perfectly, you know, fit for you or not, well, you have to take time to do that. And in my experience, um, I don't 
think there's that much of a push for women to have a man. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I don't think women are looking for it. When I was younger, I'll be 52 in a couple of days. So the way I was raised by this woman born in 1923, there was this there was this understanding that we should we should get married in order to be qualified as as a woman. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of needed a husband. It's like getting a degree. They literally would say some of the girls at Howard University were there for their MRS degree. They're there to find a man. Right. I mean, no, that's, that's find something. A good man who is educated. College who's educated going, who's going somewhere. Exactly. But it's not as necessary anymore. You see, for one, we've had generations of marriages to look at to say, oh, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money if it doesn't work out. And we just have experience to look mm -hmm. at marriage at an institution and shake our fist at it and say, maybe this is not, you know, economically viable. Maybe it's not necessary. Maybe I'm enough by myself. There's a mm -hmm. big movement now for women um, who believe, who know, who stand in their truth, uh, that they are complete. You were born complete. Mm -hmm. You were born, you, you came into this world with everything you could possibly need. There's no man, no anything. Not even a child can right. complete you. You are complete. And women are coming into that understanding. And becoming more conscious and now. more woke about it. Yeah, yeah, and I think as a result, we don't worry about what people think about what we do with our vaginas. So when you ask me, would I still be doing Punani Puts? No, because it's a different, it's a different group of people out here now. It's a different nation of people. And it's not just black women. Mm -hmm. It's all women are putting their foot down and saying, this is not, you know, a, a resting place for you to come and get the strength to go on with, with your, with your week, mm -hmm. you know, this is more than that. This is my body. And you can't bring horrible things into my temple. You just can't. I don't want the the girl next door, I don't want her pussy on your dick to come and get inside of me. The people are just really more um, responsible mm -hmm. about their sexuality. And this is reflective in statistics everywhere. You can see it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know... Um you know, you're right, in, in the state like Georgia, you have so many great um, colleges and institutions, particularly, you know, historical black colleges and, the, and you know, the women, you know, black women are, I think black women, the last I checked, uh, the stats say the most educated in terms of advanced degrees. And That's so, amazing. It's amazing, right? It's amazing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, but you still, but you, you know, you still have the you know, those women, black and white, you have women that go to college, like you said, just for that MRS, and like, you know, ideally, you know, you need to be there getting the education, you know, getting a you know, degree, making some of yourself, but you do have a lot of women that go to college, and look, they're just there to get that man, you know, that's pre-law or pre-med or the basketball player or whatever, I mean, they're thinking, you know, beyond, they're thinking about family, they're thinking about children. Um, Which we need, too. Yeah, we need, we need moms. Need we need more moms. Um, there's so many children too who just mm -hmm. have nowhere to go, you know, and a lot of people are very aware of that. My daughter, she's 18 mm -hmm. and has already decided that she's going to adopt. She's already decided. She's like, the world is crowded, you know, so Adoption is important. we're just, we're just being more responsible, I think, and not mm -hmm. waiting for our men to tell us. Well, do you see that? I do see that more, and I, I agree with you, actually, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I do think that there is a movement, a conscious movement going on with a lot of women who are overt in that they, they're not looking for validation through marriage or a husband or, or family, you know, whereas, you know, you do have a lot of those women who feel like they're not complete until a man gives them attention. They're not complete until a man proposes to them, they're not complete, they're not really complete until they get a man's last name. And so it's going to shock the system. You're gonna it's gonna, you know, you you're destabilizing things. We have all these droves and droves of women saying like, look, we're already enough. We're already complete mm -hmm. and we're not we're not searching for validation through marriage. We're you know, because again, a lot of women are seeing nowadays that you can grow up and be the the good girl and do all the things right. And still not get a husband, 
still not get a family. And or get a husband who cheats, as is right. evidence in Beyonce's case. So she's probably right at the cusp of that change. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like she's still old school because she ain't. She's not. How old is she? 30 she's she's about 30, 39 or forty. Okay, so yeah, she she's still. I still value marriage. I'm mm -hmm. a I'm a terrible like I just stay married. I don't even know what my problem is really. <laughs> I've never been in a place in my life where I could that's why I look at Megan and them and I'm just like amazed. Like, oh my God. Like, going? cause cause the confidence is so real. The other little one, um, I can't think of her name now. Cardi um, or Cardi B. Yes. I love her too. I love her too, man. Her her energy is just She's so confident. She it's speaks It's unmistakable. Her mind. And she's, I just love it. And again, you know, just at the risk of sounding redundant, I mean, she's very, they both are unapologetic. They don't care what you think about them, their sexuality, what they do with their sexuality. They don't care. You know, Cardi B has gone on record and told people, look, her pussy is her best friend. Um, hey, that's as it should be. Right. <laughs> and so they're, and at the end of the day, they also, um, you know, they, they, contradict that narrative like you have to be the good girl to find a husband or find a man whereas you have women who are pushing out a little doing what they want and still finding men mm -hmm. still finding husbands mm -hmm. and so no I, I um you know when you mentioned them and and some others out there um they really are they're doing some great work they're speaking up they're giving a voice to the voiceless and you know again megan stallion um doing big things just graduated from college with a degree in health administration. And yeah, she, she's doing it. Um, before we wrap up, and really quickly, everybody out there, if you're, if you're following the channel, make sure you give us a good like, drop a comment uh, down below, make sure you follow, hit that bell so you can get the notifications. And if you're on Facebook, make sure you find the Ringside Digital Community. Just go to your search bar, type in Ringside LLC, and either myself or one of the admins, we will um, accept you into the group. Okay, Justin, before we wrap up, and this has been amazing, and I really hope uh, we can do a part two because there's some more information I want to get out of you. But before we wrap up, can you give everyone your complete social media website? Where can they find you and where can they purchase the books? Um, they can just go to jessicaholter.com, which <laughs> will pretty much send them everywhere. It's a lot. It's 25 years plus of material so mm -hmm. I can give you a long list of stuff but if you could remember my name which is Jessica Holzer just go to jessicaholzer.com it'll take you pretty much anywhere and if you can only remember my Punani then you can look for Punani Poets on Google or anywhere else and it'll take you to our Instagram we have um, we have sites all over the place we have music and video at Punani TV there's so much to see Punani TV. Weeks playing in our Punani, really. All right. This, you know, all this mentioned about Punani, certainly uh, uh, doing something new over here. Hold up that book again. <laughs> Ver verbal Penetration. Verbal Penetration, yes. This book is out of print, so it's, it's a, going to be a hard to find book as soon as I finish um, distributing these last. I think we have a few hundred copies left of that book in mm -hmm. cover form. And um, we are working on an audiobook of that. And um, I have a novel too called The Punani Experience mm. that is available on Amazon and at simonsays.com. But um, yeah, just do your little Punani search. I wanted to tell you about my youth program. Go for it. So it's really quickly kind of taking precedence for me in terms of projects that I want to get done expeditiously. And this one is called Voices of Foster Care. It is a speech program. It is through my nonprofit organization, which is Hip Inc. It is um, for, I'm looking for six talented young men who are aging out of foster care or have recently aged out of foster care and are interested in learning how to do public speaking mm. to be part of this program which will be filmed and broadcast somewhere hopefully somewhere really incredible but yeah it's a fascinating program i have it all outlined and it's just waiting to meet your acquaintance so to find out more about that you can um, go to our website at www.com 
VoicesOfFosterCare.com. One more time, say that, say that website. VoicesOfFosterCare.com. Nice, beautiful, I'm digging it. Everybody out there, make sure you find Jessica Halter. Make sure you get on that Google, probably not a good idea on a work computer, but get on <laughs> Google and type in Punani Poets mm -hmm. and you will find everything you need. This has been Troy Vaughn, also known as Trey Amazing. This is Ringside Corner Confessions, and we will see you guys again. Thank you again, Jessica. Thank you for having me.